The operating team froze in shock when the lead surgeon fled the operating room. They didn't know that on the table lay. Hard times began in the country. The economic crisis hit the lives of ordinary citizens hard. Days arrived when every morning started with uncertainty and fear for the future. Stores emptied, prices for basic goods soared, and the news constantly talked about new difficulties. We've never lived well, so why start now, right? A man grimly summed up, turning off the TV. In this challenging environment lived a family, the father, who worked in a construction company, faced a wave of layoffs, and the mother, accustomed to being a housewife, no longer knew how to help her husband. They had a daughter, an elementary school student, who heard the adults talk daily about some evil Mr. Crisis who took their money. Family evenings, once filled with laughter and joy, were now often tense. Amidst constant news about rising prices and increasing crime rates, the parents tried to protect their daughter from anxious thoughts, but it became increasingly difficult for the adults to remain optimistic. Discussions about how to allocate the meager family budget or what to do if the situation worsened became routine. John, look, today we still have a bit of pasta and rice. I traded with the neighbor for some cheese and a couple of cans of chicken, gave her Jess's old dress, the woman said, leading her husband to the kitchen table where all the available food was laid out. In the cupboards, we have bits and pieces. Flour, oil, salt, sugar. We have enough of that. But we are running out of decent side dishes. Well, the man began, pressing his lips together in thought, I can take a few books from my father's collection to the junk dealers. They're rare. Originals. Or I can go across the road. Some guy is building a garage. I could try to get some work as a laborer. Every day, the mother checked if they had enough food to prepare dinner, often choosing the cheapest and most accessible options. The father, trying to support the family, sought odd jobs, but the work was unstable and poorly paid. Sometimes he came home late at night, tired and disappointed that he couldn't provide the same level of life for his family. As the crisis escalated, the family's life became unrecognizable. Previously, the father's income alone was enough to ensure a stable and comfortable existence. But soon, the mother had to go to work as well. She got a job at a local store with a small salary, and sometimes she could bring home discounted goods. Despite both working, the family barely made ends meet. The mortgage forced them to count every penny, and the car loan taken out in more prosperous times now seemed like an unbearable burden. The payments consumed most of their income, leaving very little for other needs. John, please don't sell the car. Monica sometimes started the conversation, holding a notebook with their financial plan written out. You use it for work. And I take Jess to the doctor and school. The loan may be big, but the car helps us live. The man thoughtfully looked at the pile of bills spread out on the table. His lips were chapped and ragged from stress. He often bit or picked at them with his nails to calm himself. I know, honey, I know, he said, picking up a calculator, but we're already at a dead end. Without the loan, we might stay afloat, but now. Okay, let's see. This hell can't last forever, right? In addition to financial problems, the family faced Jessica's worsening health. Her eyesight rapidly deteriorated, requiring expensive treatment and regular doctor visits. The last of their savings went towards buying necessary medicines and paying for medical appointments. They had to economize on everything, denying themselves the basic joys of life. Evenings, once spent enjoying family dinners, now turned into endless calculations and budget planning for the next month. The atmosphere at home grew tense, each day bringing new challenges and worries about the future. During the crisis, family life resembled a battlefield. The girls' parents could not find common ground, their conversations increasingly ending in loud arguments that escalated into real dramas with broken dishes and damaged furniture. For the girl, trying to cope with her school responsibilities, home became akin to a torture chamber. Even expensive glasses couldn't fully correct her vision, and the school board remained a blurry picture. In class, she felt detached because she couldn't see what the teacher wrote. She had to ask someone to read aloud. The only good thing about the crisis was that people became a bit more united. 
Help a classmate with a test, and tomorrow her parents would share food with yours. No one mocked children for old or cheap clothes anymore. Almost everyone wore the same. Only a few would joke about Jess's thick glasses, and that was quickly stopped. But at home, where it should have been her refuge, it was impossible to study. Noise and shouting distracted her from homework and studies. Every evening, the girl tried to find the quietest corner of the house, but even there, she couldn't escape the noise of arguments from other rooms. Damn it, John, why did you sell that package? You said you put old things in the closet. What's wrong with you? The man snapped irritably, not even having closed the front door yet. First, you say sell it, then it turns out you didn't mean it. Make up your mind before talking to me. The woman angrily threw a blue bag at her husband. John barely caught it. Half of the thing spilled out onto the floor. The blue one, John. The blue bag. I see it's blue. What got into your head? Monica came close to her husband. Locks of her blonde hair stuck to her sweaty forehead. From the moment she realized John had sold the wrong things, she couldn't find peace. You were supposed to sell the things from the blue bag. But you sold the pink one with Jess's good winter clothes. Since when are you colorblind? Now we have to find money for new winter shoes, a coat, pants. Tell me, where will we get them, John? Why can't you do what I ask? I get ready for work in complete darkness, John snarled through clenched teeth, throwing the blue bag on the floor. Why did you put the bags next to each other in the first place? The family's situation was so tense that each new day began with apprehension. Would it start with another argument or pass relatively calmly? This constant tension put a heavy strain on the child's psyche, exacerbating her feelings of anxiety and loneliness, which she had to face daily. The situation at the school Jessica attended also began to rapidly deteriorate amidst the economic crisis. The teaching staff, long suffering from inadequate funding and low salaries, started losing key members. Experienced teachers who provided stability to the educational process began quitting one after another. They left, complaining about the inability to support their families on such modest incomes, leaving behind empty classrooms and unresolved curriculum issues. Mrs. Robinson, where is Mrs. Good? Jessica asked, raising her hand at the start of the lesson. The teacher adjusted her collar. The situation at the school was already out of control. People were leaving, and there was no one to replace them. The children felt abandoned, with no one to attend to them. She. She resigned, Jesse, Mrs. Robinson replied with an apologetic smile. But meet Miss Hudson. She will be assisting us in the lessons. Children, say hello to our guest. In an attempt to fill the growing void, the school administration started bringing in student interns from local teacher training colleges. These young people, still full of enthusiasm but clearly not ready for independent work, became temporary replacements for the departed teachers. However, their lack of experience quickly became apparent. Children, please calm down. Children. Poor Miss Hudson could not outshout the crowd of mischievous kids. The lesson has already started. Guys, there will be a test next lesson. You need to prepare. Please. The interns, though striving to do their best, often found themselves unable to manage the class or effectively explain complex topics. Their lessons, though conducted with a great desire to help, often turned into chaotic and unproductive sessions. In the classrooms, the students felt abandoned, not receiving the necessary support and guidance. These changes at school only exacerbated the difficulties Jessica was already facing at home. The inability to focus on her studies due to family problems was now compounded by the lack of qualified help at school. The educational process, which was supposed to be a pillar and stability in every child's life, turned into another source of stress and uncertainty. This continued until high school. But one day, her family faced a cruel blow. That day started as usual for Jess, with school lessons and friendly talks about homework on the way home. However, when she opened the door to her house, she was met with an unexpected silence, broken only by quiet sobs coming from the living room. 
At that moment, the air seemed electrified, and every step through the house heightened her sense of anxiety. Even the rustling of her school blouse made the girl flinch. Her gray eyes hungrily scanned the dimness that filled the apartment. Mom? In the living room, her mother sat on the couch, hiding her face in her hands and quietly crying. Scattered around her were photos and some personal belongings that were usually kept in the parents' bedroom. Her blonde hair was disheveled, and her makeup was smeared from tears. Mom, what happened? Her mother continued to cry, not paying attention to her daughter's presence. Words of comfort stuck in Jessica's throat, and the girl, who had just turned 17, had to wait patiently. Finally, the woman raised her tear-stained eyes. Honey, Dad left. Monica sobbed loudly. I'm so sorry, sweetheart. Standing in the doorway, the girl watched her mother, not knowing how to react. Her heart clenched with pain and confusion. The family she knew suddenly ceased to exist as it always had. The thought spun in her head that her father, it seemed, couldn't cope with the accumulating difficulties and chose to run away instead of staying and fighting with them. John, who always seemed like a strong pillar of the family, was gone. He simply packed his things and left without leaving any explanations or farewell words. Monica, usually so strong and determined, now seemed utterly broken and defenseless. Mom, Jessica sat on the couch next to her mother and embraced her. It's... It's okay. Do you hear? We'll manage. As painful as it was for Jessica, she had to accept this new reality where she and her mother were left alone. It was a moment when she truly felt the weight of adult life, full of uncertainty and loss. After the tough challenges of her parents' divorce and the economic crisis, a period of stabilization began in the family's life. It was as if fate decided to reward them for the difficulties they had endured. The country's economy started gradually recovering, bringing positive changes to their lives. Jessica's mother received a pay raise, which provided timely support for the family that had long needed it. Meanwhile, the girl, who had already become a young woman, was able to resolve her vision problem. At some point, as if another blessing, the necessary amount for paying for vision correction fell into their lap. Her mother carefully concealed where the money for such an expensive operation came from, preferring not to discuss this topic to avoid reminding them of past difficulties. Despite all the obstacles that came her way, young Jessica did not slow down in her pursuit of her dream of becoming a doctor. She successfully passed the entrance exams and was admitted to medical university, where, despite the initial difficulties related to adapting to a new academic environment and the lack of financial support, she managed to achieve high results. Miss Tucker, you are truly a find for our university, her anatomy professor told her. Stay among the best. You set yourself on a path to success right away. And in your first year, you were just dealing with your vision. Your mother can be proud of you. Hard work and unwavering perseverance helped her not only adapt to the new conditions, but also earn a higher scholarship, which significantly eased her financial situation and allowed her to focus on her studies. This success symbolized that even after the darkest periods in life, there is always a chance for a bright future. She realized that any difficulties are surmountable if you don't give up and keep moving towards your goal, despite all obstacles. When the fear of the crisis faded, the family took decisive steps to strengthen their financial position. One significant step was getting rid of the car loan. The decision to sell the car was not easy, as it had long been not only a means of transportation, but also a symbol of some family well-being. However, simple necessity and the desire to reduce debt pressure prevailed. When the buyers came for the car, Jessica gently ran her hand over its roof. Goodbye, old friend, the girl whispered with a touch of sadness. You were my childhood. I guess it's time to grow up. Selling the car allowed them to pay off the remaining loan, freeing the family from monthly payments that burdened their budget. The remaining funds were used to partially pay off the mortgage, which also helped reduce the overall amount of monthly payments. This financial maneuver not only improved their current situation, but also gave them greater confidence in the future. Although they couldn't entirely rid themselves of mortgage obligations immediately, the significant reduction in debt brought long-awaited peace to the family's life. 
they began to feel more liberated, knowing that while the path to full financial independence was still long and arduous, the first confident steps had already been taken. Now they could plan their future with less debt burden and greater hope for stability and prosperity. At the university, where she spent most of her time aspiring to a medical career, she met him, a young man named Tyler, who, like her, was fully immersed in his studies. It was a meeting of two lonely hearts finding a deep kinship in each other. Their relationship developed slowly, as both understood the value of the time and effort they invested in their future. The girl, feeling like a little schoolgirl, would involuntarily blush every time she encountered him in the corridor. Hi, Jesse, Tyler said with a sincere smile, and voluntarily straightening his shoulders, how was Barton's lecture? Quite the ordeal, right? Jessica clutched the collar of her white coat. Mrs. Barton taught Latin and was, apparently, a bit eccentric. Nobody wanted to talk to her, much less stay alone with her after class. But the girl had almost forgotten about the strange teacher. She didn't immediately understand what Tyler had asked her. Huh? Barton, she asked, more to herself, oh, Mrs. Barton, right. Well, she's quite unique. Yeah. The guy smiled brightly again. He stepped closer to his friend. To be honest, he often felt lost when he saw Jess. All right, see you later, he said, awkwardly touching her shoulder, which elicited a stifled giggle from her friends. I'm already late for histology. I'll be waiting by the gates after class. At first, their interaction was limited to friendly meetings after lectures when he would walk her home. These moments were full of innocent conversations about the day, discussions about the difficulties of study material and future plans. Gradually, these leisurely walks turned into evening meetings in the park where they could enjoy the quiet and solitude. Unexpected bouquets of flowers became another pleasant addition to their meetings, symbolizing the development and deepening of their feelings. Jesse's friends couldn't stay out of it. Jess, what is this kindergarten? When will you start thinking about something serious? Brittany sighed heavily. Has he ever taken you to a restaurant? Or do you just wander around the park like two school kids? Jessica pursed her lips. She genuinely enjoyed walking in the park. Fresh air, pleasant conversations. Tyler's company. Bree, not all at once. We're studying. What restaurants? Oh, my God, Julie, who had been sitting quietly until then, rolled her eyes. Jesse, you are adults. At least hint to him about going somewhere besides the park. Exactly, you're studying. Why waste time on park walks? Let him suggest something more. The girl crossed her arms. In a way, her friends might have been right. But on the other hand, she was content. So why complicate things? Deep in thought, Jessica scrunched her nose. Tyler often said she looked like an angry hamster in such moments. Thinking of him, Jess involuntarily smiled. No, everything was just fine as it was. As graduation and thesis defense approached, their relationship entered a new stage. Now, free from academic burdens, they began to spend more time together, allowing themselves to enjoy each other's company in a romantic setting. Dates and restaurants with beautiful courtesies became their new reality, where each moment was filled with joy at the realization that they had found each other in this big world. These meetings crowned their long acquaintance, a moment when they could not only celebrate their graduation, but also plan their future together. They both felt they had found not just love, but also support in each other, which would contribute to their mutual growth and development. Jessica fondly recalled a family dinner at a restaurant. Monica, Tyler's parents, and his younger sisters were all at the table. Suddenly, he got down on one knee and asked, Will you marry me, Jessica Tucker? The rest was shrouded in a pleasant haze of memories. Trying on wedding dresses, bringing the best one home with her mom, budgeting for the wedding with Tyler, decorating invitations, and distributing them to friends. Then they were already decorating the banquet hall, preparing it for a modest but very cozy celebration. The altar, vows, and exchange of rings. They stepped into a new life full of hopes and mutual plans. 
both graduated from medical school with honors, and now, filled with enthusiasm and professional ambitions, they began their careers. Choosing a place of work was not a problem for them. What mattered most was being close to each other and supporting one another in any situation. That was their main family creed. They chose a district hospital, which wasn't the most prestigious place to work, but offered ample opportunities for young specialists. It was the perfect option for a young couple eager to apply their knowledge in practice while staying together. The hospital, located in a quiet area, needed qualified staff and offered good conditions for young doctors, making it an attractive place to start their joint careers. On the threshold of the district hospital, shrouded in a light autumn mist, Jess and Tyler exchanged impressions. Remember, Ty, you always said you wanted to work where you could make a real difference, not just follow protocols. Jess asked, smiling at him through the sunbeams breaking through the clouds. Yes, and this place seems just right, Tyler replied, looking at the old hospital building. Not the most modern or famous, but here we can really help. I like that we're together here, Jess said, taking his hand. Supporting each other, growing professionally, and overcoming all difficulties together. Tyler squeezed her hand firmly in response. Together we can handle anything, he said confidently. From their first days at the hospital, Jess and Tyler became part of the team, quickly earning the respect and recognition of their colleagues. Their hard work, responsible attitude, and desire to help patients did not go unnoticed. Working in various departments, they brought new ideas and approaches to the hospital, positively impacting the level of medical care. Thus, their professional and personal paths intertwined closely. With each passing day, their relationship grew stronger, and their contribution to the development of the medical institution became increasingly significant. Starting their joint career at the district hospital, they proved that medical vocation and family harmony could perfectly complement each other, providing a powerful incentive for growth and self-improvement. Internship turned out to be a real test for both. Tyler, diving into the world of endocrinology, dedicated his time to studying and treating hormonal disorders, which required not only deep theoretical knowledge, but also the ability to see subtle interconnections in the human body. His days were filled with analyzing complex cases, consulting with more experienced colleagues, and constant self-education. At the same time, the girl faced the harsh reality of the oncology department. Every day, she saw how the disease spared neither the old nor the young. Working with oncology patients required not only professional knowledge, but also immense emotional investment. The advanced cancer cases she encountered were especially challenging. Patients came with hopes of being saved, sometimes from the most remote corners of the country, and each case posed the most difficult questions, how to alleviate suffering, how to prolong life, how to maintain human dignity in such conditions. Many of her patients avoided seeking medical help until the last moment, relying on folk remedies or simply fearing a diagnosis. This often led to the disease being detected in its later stages when the chances of successful treatment were significantly lower. The young woman had to not only treat the body, but also work with the patient's deep-seated prejudices and fears, which added emotional strain. Evening time at the medical center usually arrived quietly, but this time it was filled with a tired but important conversation between two young doctors. These small talks helped them stay sane. Sometimes, they needed to talk about work specifically with each other. How was your day, Jess? Tyler asked, leaning wearily on the staff room table. Tough, as always, she smiled softly, removing her latex gloves. It's oncology, Ty. Every case is a fight for life. I can imagine. Endocrinology doesn't forgive mistakes either, but facing cancer every day. It must be incredibly hard. Jessica wrinkled her nose again, thinking. Seeing this familiar expression, the man couldn't help but smile. To him, she seemed like the most beautiful woman on earth. Even now, tired, with smudged makeup and red eyes from exhaustion. Especially now. Sometimes I think the hardest part isn't the diagnoses or the treatment, but meeting patients who have been just watching their tumor grow for years, Jess said thoughtfully. How do you cope with your patients? We have less emotional burden but more analytical work. 
Hormonal disorders require constant attention to detail. You know, every wrongly chosen hormone can seriously affect a patient's quality of life. Yes, that's true, she agreed, tiredly rubbing her face. Does it help you feel like you're making someone's life better? Every day, Jess. But I know you're doing incredible work too. We both knew what we were getting into when we chose medicine. It's a path full of challenges, but also opportunities for growth. We both help people, and that's the most important thing. Jess nodded, smiled, and looked at Tyler with warmth and gratitude in her eyes. Thank you, Ty. Sometimes you just need to hear that you're not alone. Always here for you, Jess. Together we're stronger. For the young woman, every day in the oncology department became a lesson in courage, compassion, and medical resilience, and for the young man, it was an opportunity to deepen his knowledge and help people on their path to recovery. Two years of intensive internship proved to be a time not only of continuous professional development, but also a test for their family relationships. Every day, they became more skilled in their specialties, gradually gaining the experience necessary for young specialists. In the end, completing their internship marked the beginning of a new phase in their lives and careers. They were ready to face the challenges the medical world presented. As an endocrinologist and an oncologist, they had already earned respect in the medical community of their city. Their professionalism and dedication attracted the attention of private clinics, which offered them lucrative work conditions. These offers came at a critical moment in their lives when they were considering buying a car and planning a family. Jessica had long dreamed of a child, and Tyler supported this idea. Have you seen the offers from the clinics? Tyler began, flipping through papers on the kitchen table after dinner. Yes, they look promising, Jessica replied, leaning her elbows on the table and tiredly massaging her temples. But it means we'll have to work in different places. Do you think we can handle it? Tyler looked at her, his gaze full of contemplation. He was turning over in his mind the dream of a happy family. But many say that sometimes you have to sacrifice something for happiness. I think this could be our chance, Jess. The choice between stability and financial prospects was not easy. Working together in one hospital was convenient and pleasant, but plans for the future required sacrifices. After long reflections and mutual consultations, they decided to accept the offers from private clinics. Thus, they started working in different medical institutions, each in their field. Although they were separated by workplaces, this did not affect their relationship. They continued to support each other, exchanging knowledge and experience, which only strengthened them as specialists and as a couple. This decision proved not only financially beneficial, but also useful for their professional growth, giving each the opportunity to develop in their specialty. In the medical community of their hometown, the staffing situation left much to be desired. Despite the presence of a medical university that produced narrow-profile specialists, many young doctors aspired to move to large cities where higher salaries, better career growth conditions, and more modern medical facilities were offered. This trend particularly affected some key specialties, such as oncology, where specialists were in especially short supply. When a young oncologist, freshly out of her internship, stayed in the city, it became a real find for the local clinic, suffering from a lack of qualified staff in this field. The clinic immediately showed active interest, as having a qualified oncologist could significantly improve the quality of services provided and increase the number of treatment programs available to cancer patients. The clinic administration quickly contacted Jessica, offering her attractive working conditions, including a competitive salary, opportunities for professional development, and participation in advanced research. They emphasized how important it was for the city to retain such a specialist, especially in an area where every experienced doctor could save many lives. This sudden interest in her qualifications and potential was very flattering for the young oncologist, Despite other offers she might receive from clinics in other cities, the opportunity to breathe new life into the healthcare of her hometown and help her fellow citizens seemed particularly appealing. Working in a private clinic opened new horizons for Jessica. She found that working conditions here were significantly different from those she was used to in municipal institutions. The facilities were bright and well-equipped, 
and the equipment was modern and functional, which greatly facilitated the diagnostic and treatment process. Her colleagues at the clinic were professionals, many of whom came here not only for convenience and a good salary, but also for the opportunity to practice medicine more qualitatively without the bureaucratic constraints of public medical institutions. The doctors and medical staff of the private clinic were fully absorbed in their work, showing deep care and dedication to their profession. Take Wilson, the neurosurgeon. He used to work in a city clinic, but the years were taking their toll. It was calmer in the private clinic. Less running up and down the floors, more help from the staff, and modern equipment. Yet in conversation, he remained a sweet, kind old man. And Nurse Rosa was a woman of great fortitude. She used to work in a psychiatric dispensary. So, in the presence of this lady, no rude patient posed a threat. Because Mama Rosa, as her colleagues often called her, quickly found the right words for not very pleasant people. In this team, Jessica felt not only like a part of a team, but also like part of a large professional family, where every member was dedicated to their work and striving to provide the best medical services at their clinic. This shared commitment and desire to help people made even the most challenging and stressful days productive. Lunch breaks or the big gaps between appointments and surgeries were always spent in very pleasant company. Jessica couldn't have dreamed of such an environment. Sitting in the procedure room now, she watched a nurse walk between the metal tables. Tall and broad-shouldered, there was a certain charm about her that was rare in women. Maybe it was her stateliness. Rosa, how do you manage to stay so calm with the most difficult patients? Mr. Burns was quite a handful today, and you didn't even flinch, Jessica asked in amazement as she poured herself some coffee. Rosa smiled while measuring out some medication. Experience, Jesse, it's all about experience. After working in a psychiatric ward, all the patients here seem like angels. Plus, when you see that your words really help, it's easier to have a dialogue. It's not like trying to convince a half-blind old lady that she's Napoleon. And what about Wilson? He's quite elderly, isn't he? Jessica continued, sitting closer and smiling widely. Oh, Wilson is thriving here, Rosa sighed, glancing back to ensure he wasn't behind her. We don't have as much stress as in a public hospital, you know? He can focus on his patients without rushing. At his age, you can't hurry. He may have a steady hand when holding a scalpel, but in the office, he's just a simple old man. He needs more time to talk with his patients. You can feel it, Jessica agreed. Everything here seems somehow more humane, doesn't it? Rosa nodded, placing a bundle of tools on the table. You know, I think that's why many of us stay here. We like the feeling that we can do more without getting tangled up in bureaucracy and endless paperwork. Here, each of us can be a real doctor, not just another cog in the system. Jessica smiled, feeling the same dedication to her work as her colleagues. This was what attracted her to the private clinic, and she was glad she had chosen this place. Yes, maybe Tyler wasn't here with her, but she wasn't alone. She always had a reliable shoulder to lean on in difficult times here. Among the doctors, there were many with significant experience who were recognized experts in their fields, allowing Jessica to grow professionally, constantly learning from her senior colleagues. The exchange of knowledge and clinical experience was constant, and everyone could voice their opinions or share observations, contributing to overall development and improvement of medical care. Working as an oncologist demanded not only professional knowledge from the young woman, but also incredible mental resilience. Every day, she faced new challenges. She often wondered if she had the strength and knowledge to do everything possible for her patients. Oncology didn't forgive mistakes and didn't offer second chances. She had to consider every step, weigh all the pros and cons before prescribing a treatment that could be both life-saving and extremely hard on the patient's body. But every successfully treated case brought immense satisfaction and confirmed the correctness of her chosen profession. In these moments, she felt that her efforts were not in vain, and it gave her the strength to move forward, despite all the difficulties and emotional trials that inevitably accompanied the work of an oncologist. 
Returning from medical leave is usually accompanied by a couple of leisurely days, but for Jessica, there was no time for gradual immersion back into work. A complex surgery was scheduled for her arrival at the clinic, requiring immediate diving into medical documentation and the specifics of the current case. The urgent patient was a man with a rare and aggressive form of cancer. Eugene, another oncologist who had temporarily handled his case, had made preliminary preparations and provided everything needed for the surgery, but a full assessment and strategic decisions required Jess's input. She spent the evening studying the patient's medical history, analyzing test results, and previous treatments. The next morning, she met with Eugene to discuss the details of the upcoming surgery. The doctors thoroughly analyzed every aspect of the case, discussing possible risks and optimal approaches to treatment. They constantly handled sheets of analyses and examinations. The importance of the moment was heightened by the fact that every decision could critically impact the patient's treatment outcome. We need to be as careful and precise as possible, emphasized Jess, flipping through the pages of the medical chart. This type of tumor requires a special approach, and every step during the surgery must be meticulously planned. Eugene nodded in agreement, adding, that's right. It's good that you're here. A fresh perspective is exactly what we need for a successful outcome. Preparation for the surgery took several hours, during which the team discussed every possible scenario, planning actions for each stage of the intervention. This was yet another chance to prove that even after a forced break, she could return and continue helping her patients with the same dedication and professionalism. No medical leave could take away her confidence in her actions. The operating room was filled with tense silence, broken only by the sounds of medical equipment and the whispers of the staff preparing for the procedure. The air was thick with the presence of death, terrifyingly close. Jessica stood by the operating table, looking at the patient's face, which seemed hauntingly familiar. Under the anesthesia mask, his features reminded her of her father's, a man whose disappearance left an unhealed wound in her life. She saw the distinctive hooked nose and the mole peeking out from under the cap was just like her own. A shiver ran through her body as she tried to push away the memories that flooded her mind. It can't be him, she told herself, glancing at the medical chart to confirm the patient's name. The name was entirely different, but doubts continued to gnaw at Jessica from within. She remembered the day her mother sat in the kitchen, crying and staring into space after her father left and never returned. Her mother never explained why he disappeared, leaving only a heavy veil of silence instead of answers. And now, before her lay a man whose face seemed like a stamp from the past. Tension filled the operating room as the young oncologist suddenly stopped, staring at the patient's face. Her colleagues, noticing her confusion, began calling out to her and shaking her shoulders, trying to bring her back to reality. But instead of answering, she abruptly turned and, as if in a panic, ran out of the operating room. Throwing off her surgical gloves, she rushed to her locker in the dressing room. Jessica? Eugene called out, startled. Jessie, where are you going? Taking out her mobile phone, the girl frantically began dialing her mother's number. The hallway, usually full of sounds and movement, seemed unnaturally quiet, and each ring in the receiver sounded like an echo of her own fears and doubts. The wait was true torture. In that brief moment when her daughter called, the air seemed to freeze. A barrage of questions hit Monica. It took her a few seconds to gather her thoughts, but Jess didn't wait and pressed on. Why did you never tell me about Dad? Why did he leave? Jessica's words were hard to get out, each one burdened with years of misunderstanding and silence. The mother was in a stupor for a few seconds. Jesse, dear, I... I thought we had already gone through this. We both decided never to go back to this topic. Her voice trembled as she tried to stay calm. No, Mom, we never discussed it. Never. I just saw him, or at least someone who looks like him. On the operating table, Mom. Jess struggled to hold back her tears, each word disrupting her breath. There was a heavy pause on the phone, then a wail. Her mother could no longer hold back. 
Her sobs drowned her voice, and the doctor, listening to this outburst of emotion, felt growing anxiety and pity in her heart. I... I should have told you earlier. Forgive me, forgive. Her mother's words were lost in her own tears, and the conversation became more blurred and unintelligible. Thus, through tears and uncertainty, an old secret that had been lying between mother and daughter like an invisible but palpable wall began to unfold. That morning, when young Jesse came home, the heavy atmosphere was palpable right from the hallway. Her mother was sitting on the couch, hugging herself, rocking back and forth. She cried quietly so the neighbors wouldn't hear, but each sob was so deep and sincere that the girl immediately felt a pain in her chest. Mom, what's wrong? Why are you crying? The daughter cautiously asked, sitting down next to her and gently touching her mother's hand. Her mother slowly raised her head, wiping her tears with a large handkerchief. Her eyes were red, and her gaze was weary from worries about something utterly unthinkable. Dad, he left. She struggled to get the words out, each one shaking the air like a blacksmith's hammer. Jessica shook her head. A fragment of memories that had haunted her for many years. Every time, the same scene. The long walk down the hallway, her mother's crying, and a sense of hopelessness. It seemed that everything was in the past, Jess had her own family on the way, but these memories still visited her too often. The girl crouched down, leaning her back against the cold hospital wall. At least tell me now. Her mother took a deep breath as if preparing for a long story. He was sick, very sick. And we didn't have the money for his treatment. I was ready to do anything, even sell the car, take out loans. But he, he didn't want that. He couldn't let us drown in debt because of his illness. Jessica pulled off her mask and wiped her eyes. Her hair had come loose from the tight ponytail and spread over her shoulders. She genuinely didn't understand what was happening in her life right now. Keeping silent, she had to hold her breath for a moment to pull herself together. She still needed answers. But why didn't I know? Why did he just leave? The daughter's voice trembled with unshared pain and misunderstanding. He thought he was doing it for us, to earn money. He wanted to come back. Her mother stopped, lowering her eyes. But the illness progressed faster than we expected. He had to take a risk and go to an old acquaintance. This story unfolded in the shadow of a global crisis that engulfed the country. A sense of helplessness and inevitability filled every corner of their home, leaving little room for hope. When the family's reality became unbearable, John remembered a man whose life he had once saved. Lewis. This man now held a high position in society, but he was far from being a law-abiding citizen. Jonathan turned to his old friend for help, and Lewis agreed to pay for the necessary treatment. In return, however, he demanded services that would pull John into the criminal world. What else could a cancer patient do? John stood before Lewis in his luxurious office, feeling every cell in his body resisting this meeting. The room was quiet, with only the sounds of the city occasionally penetrating through the closed windows. Lewis, I didn't come to you for nothing, John began, trying to hide the anxiety in his voice. Do you remember the old debt? I pulled you out, drunk and barely alive, from that nightclub. You were covered in your own bile. And then a crowd of some idiots chased after me. Do you remember how I ran through the bushes in the park, carrying you on my back? Lewis, sitting at his desk, slowly raised his eyes to John, his face remaining impassive. Of course, I remember, John. You didn't waste your time on sports back then, my friend. But why are you bringing this up now? His voice was calm, but there was tension in it. I, I'm dying, Lou. I need surgery, and we don't have the money. You're the only one I can turn to for help. The businessman froze for a moment, then slowly nodded. And indeed, what else could John do? Lewis knew well that ordinary workers were forced to survive. It couldn't be said that the businessman was seriously worried about his old friend. But he did have some notion of honor. I'll help you, John. You deserve help for pulling me out of that. Ahem. But I have conditions. 
You will have to work off this debt. John shook his head, his heart sinking heavily. He knew this couldn't be simple. What exactly do you want from me, Lou? The man slowly stood up from his desk and walked to the window, looking at the city lights. I need a man with your skills, Jonathan. A man who isn't afraid to take risks. You'll be working for me. It won't be easy, and it certainly won't be legal, he let out a bitter laugh. I hope you haven't forgotten how to drive like you did in your younger days. Oh, your father's car was searched for all over the region, and some poles you crashed into took it from you. John froze, feeling his blood turn cold. He knew he was agreeing to a deal with the devil, but he had no choice. All right, Lewis. Give me time to get used to something other than the family sedan. I already understand what you want from me. Lewis turned, his gaze predatory, as if he saw before him the boy who feared nothing once again. You'll get the best treatment, John. You can count on me. Despite the risks and possible consequences, the ailing Jonathan agreed to the deal. His actions were driven by desperation and the desire to do everything possible to save his life. Initially, everything went according to plan, the treatment was paid for, and the father began to carry out assignments for his savior. However, soon Lewis's competitors noticed the new player. The tension in his life increased as his actions attracted the attention of dangerous people. Before fleeing the country, John managed to pass a significant sum of money to Monica, which allowed for Jessica to have the necessary eye surgery. This money became the last testament of his care for the family. After the man's departure, his traces were lost, and he never appeared in his family's life again. The woman, having received the last funds from her husband, firmly decided that it would be best for everyone to keep silent about his fate and the reasons for his disappearance to protect her daughter from a truth full of pain and danger. In the hospital corridor, filled with tense anticipation, the head surgical nurse caught up with Jessica, who was trying to control her emotions. The team of surgeons and nurses faced an unexpected situation, deciding whether to proceed with the scheduled surgery after their lead oncologist, in a state of severe shock, had left the operating room. The responsibility for the patient's life hung in the air, and no one wanted to make a decision without guidance from the lead specialist. Jessica, wiping away the last of her tears and taking a deep breath, mustered the courage and said, I can handle it. With these words, she turned and headed back to the operating room. Changing into clean surgical attire, she went through all the stages of antiseptic treatment again, preparing to return to the sterile environment of the operating room, where the team and the anesthetized patient were already waiting for her. Her steps were heavy, but the determination to return and finish what she had started outweighed them. Suppressing her anxiety, she addressed the assisting surgeon, Eugene. Are you ready to begin? Her voice trembled despite her attempts to control her emotions. Everything is ready, doctor, the assistant nodded, noticing her nervousness. Focus on the job, here and now, she reminded herself, trying to distract from her personal feelings. But the image of her father, surfacing every time she looked at the patient, complicated everything. Let's begin, Jessica finally said, taking the surgical instruments in her hands. The touch of the cold steel reminded her of her duty and professional responsibility. She had to do her job, regardless of who her patient was. The doctors continued preparing for the surgery, each movement precise and accurate. The young oncologist, although stunned by the sudden revelation, found the strength to focus on the upcoming procedure. The operation required her full dedication, and she was ready to do everything possible to help this person, despite her personal turmoil. The complexity of the surgery was borderline fantastical. A tumor cleverly entwined around a vital vessel posed a serious risk to the patient's life. Jessica, concentrating on removing the growth, understood every step she took, knowing that the slightest mistake could cost the person their life. The complex procedure ended successfully, and all that was left was to rely on postoperative therapy and hope for a favorable outcome. A whole week passed, and each day was a trial for Jess. She couldn't bring herself to enter her father's room, where he was now recovering. Inside her, mixed feelings raged, fear that his condition would worsen at the sight of her, fears that he wouldn't want to see her after all these years of separation. 
and deeply rooted anxiety that his disappearance was a conscious choice, perhaps he truly chose to leave and never come back. Such thoughts swirled in the girl's head day after day, intensifying her internal conflict and making the step into the room harder and harder. She felt on the brink of a potentially devastating conversation that could either reveal deep family wounds or, on the contrary, begin their healing. This uncertainty and fear of possible consequences made her hesitate, unable to find the strength to face the potential truth about her father's past actions. At the moment the door to the room opened, Jessica paused on the threshold, overwhelmed with emotion and uncertainty. Before her, on the hospital bed, lay a man significantly thinner but already looking healthier. Since the surgery, his complexion had become noticeably better. The silence in the room was tense, and Jonathan, meeting his daughter's gaze, froze. The girl, whose heart was beating faster, whispered the only word filled with hope and fear. Dad? Her voice was so tender and anxious that the man, unable to hold back his emotions, covered his mouth with his hand and quickly turned to the window, trying to hide his tears. Surprise and shock from the sudden meeting overwhelmed him, as he didn't expect that it would be his own daughter who turned out to be his doctor. The thought of how she might have changed her last name swirled in his head, whether she got married or maybe hated him so much that she decided to renounce everything that reminded her of the past. Finally, sitting on the edge of the bed, she touched his hand, which he grabbed in return and began to kiss frantically, whispering prayers for forgiveness. Jesse, my baby, my little princess, John quickly whispered through tears, as if afraid he didn't have time to talk to his child. Oh, God, Jesse, forgive me. I wanted to come back, Jess, I really wanted to. The girl gently touched her father's chin and lifted his head. She looked into his eyes, herself ready to burst into tears. Then why didn't you come back? Gathering his strength, the father began to tell his story, immersing his daughter in the grim details of his past. After he left the family, his life turned into a constant escape. Competitors of his old friend would not leave him alone, finding him in every new hideout. For years, he wandered from one city to another, trying to stay one step ahead of his pursuers. Changing documents became part of his reality. He changed his identity several times to ensure his safety and anonymity. These precautions were so effective that even his own daughter did not recognize him when he became her patient. John continued, explaining that his struggle for survival ended only two years ago. Lewis, the man who had offered him that fatal deal, had finally dealt with his competitors. This final act of internecine strife ended their confrontation and also allowed him to leave the criminal world. I was a driver. At least that's what we agreed on with Lewis. Jonathan choked on tears, but continued, Jesse, I went through hell. Normal people don't do the things Lewis asked me to do. I wanted to come home so badly. I. Those were monstrous things, Jess. Shoo, S-H-H-H, Dad. It's all over, right? The man nodded. He wiped his tears with the white hospital sheet and took a deep breath. After all the trials and running, returning to his hometown, Jonathan felt an overwhelming guilt and shame for his long absence. He couldn't allow himself to return to his family. The thought of how he left home for years to fight the disease, only to return with a relapse. It was too cruel an irony. John didn't want his beloved girls to think that he came crawling back for help. The man was torn between the desire to be with his family and the fear that they would consider him weak. His future plans were closely tied to the hope of recovery. Lewis generously rewarded him, giving him a high position in his company. Now, he had the money to get treated without resorting to crime. In his thoughts, he already pictured a happy family life. If he survived, he could start anew and make up for lost time with his beloved girls. You know, Dad, Jessica smiled sadly, you're in good hands. Everything will be fine. I'll fight for your life. I'm the best oncologist in the region. I'm so proud of you, sweetheart. Jonathan pulled her close and hugged her tightly. It's such a shame I wasn't there. I would give anything to have seen you grow up. Jessica suddenly drew away from her father. Her face, streaked with tears, lit up with a smile. Mom, do you want me to call mom? 
The man nodded and covered his eyes with his hand. Monica. He missed her so much, his Valkyrie. She was willing to do anything for him to come back. When the family gathered together again in the hospital room, it became difficult for everyone to breathe. Monica followed their daughter inside, barely holding back her excitement and fear. The strange silence was replaced by awkward attempts to start a conversation where each word felt like a ton. John, exhausted and pale, still struggled to realize that his closest people, who had been mere shadows in his past for many years, were standing before him. You really came back, Monica whispered, approaching the bed. Her eyes were full of tears she couldn't and didn't want to hold back. After all these years, how could you? The father shook his head, fighting the urge to comfort her, knowing that simple apologies wouldn't be enough. I know I broke our life, he began, his voice trembling with fatigue and remorse. I didn't leave because I stopped loving you. I did everything to protect you, to one day come back and make things right. The mother sat on the edge of the bed, carefully taking his hand in hers. For many years, I only blamed you, she admitted. But now that you're here, I just want to understand why. Why so long, Johnny? In this tender touch, full of intertwined hands, the father found the strength to tell his story. He explained how every step he took was dictated by the desire to protect him from the danger that followed him. All the mistakes, all the decisions he made, he spent all this time searching for a way to return without posing a threat to their safety. The words flowed slowly, each one bringing the mother closer to understanding and forgiveness, though they couldn't erase the years of lost closeness. The scene ended in tears, which seemed to wash away the burden of past years. Jessica could only quietly sob, watching her parents embrace each other. They clung to each other as if someone was trying to take them away from each other. But not this time. They would never part again. Half a year after the reunion was a difficult journey toward restoring the family. Monica and John's marriage suffered the most. Reviving their relationship was like the slow but sure blossoming of a cherry tree recovering from a fire. Every day they learned to communicate anew, share the little things, and support each other. All this time, their daughter, now a grown woman, watched them with warmth and hoped that her family had finally found lost happiness. And one beautiful spring day, when the sun was shining brightly and the air was filled with the scent of blooming trees, the man got down on one knee again before his first and only love. He proposed that she become his wife once more, to rebuild their shared future they once planned. Her eyes filled with tears of happiness as she said yes, and the wedding ring once again sparkled on her finger. Two years later, after many family celebrations and shared moments, the family received new joyous news. Unexpectedly, they found out that both the daughter and the mother were expecting. This news became a symbol of new life and new opportunities for the whole family. Both women, full of joy and anticipation, shared their hopes and dreams about the future, which now seemed so bright. This time, everything was different. No one was suffering from illnesses, life seemed full of opportunities, and the family was full of optimism. They eagerly awaited the moment when they could welcome new members to the family, ready to offer them all the love and care they once longed for. This new chapter in the family's life was full of the anticipation of happiness that they would share together.